Hey guys, this is Jeff Stanick with Figured Out Baseball. We've got a really good Figured Out Baseball podcast today that I've been looking forward to for a long, long time. Uh, we have one of the contributors to the website on the podcast today. We're being joined by Jason Colloran. Um, he shot some video for the website. Uh, I, I hope that we'll get him back for some more content in the future. But Jason is a really interesting guy and someone that, from from our conversations, he, he might be the out of all the guests I've ever had or just people I've gotten to know through the website, he might have some of the content that has made me really kind of rethink things that I thought that I knew more than anyone else. Uh, and for that reason, I've been very, very excited to have him on a podcast. So I uh, can't tell you how excited I am for this one. Let me give you a quick background on Jason before we jump into questions with him. He is a muscle activation techniques specialist. He's got nearly 20 years of experience uh, in biomechanics, consulting uh, for orthopedic surgeons, chiropractors, physical therapists, and more. Um, he is the owner of Elite Edge Fitness uh, in, in Georgia. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, he is the founder of the Kinetic Arm, formerly called the Perfect Arm, which is kind of why uh, a, a big reason for the podcast today. The Kinetic Arm won the 2020 ABCA Best of Show Award for Most Innovative Product and if you're not familiar with the ABCA, it's the biggest convention uh, held annually for baseball coaches. But Be between high school and college coaches, you'll find, you know, upwards of 7,000 coaches attend this event annually. Uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of exhibitors at these events, and and the Kinetic Arm won the 2020 Best of Show Award for the most innovative product. It's really pretty incredible. The Kinetic Arm. It is a. I'll describe it the best way I can, and I'll have Jason explain it to you. Uh, in much, much better terms probably, but it is a sleeve essentially that um, it's a stress reduction sleeve. It's cl clinically proven to reduce stress on the elbow and the shoulder while you throw a baseball or a softball or a football or, or a javelin or, or play tennis or anything that's kind of an overhand sport where uh, elbow and shoulder injuries are common. And it's designed to offload the stress on the elbow and the shoulder during your throwing motion without restricting your motion um, and, and the end range is really where a lot of the injuries take place and and this sleeve does something that no other product on the market does um, which is also which is pretty pretty great but Jason I want to first of all invite you to um, well first of all hello and welcome to the podcast but then I want you to maybe just in your own words explain in better terms uh, than what I did explain exactly what the kinetic arm is which is where we'll start the podcast all right Thanks for having me. Um, so the kinetic arm is kind of like having an external muscular system. It's going to help reinforce the shoulder and the elbow. So when you go into end range or that far layback phase, um, if you look at the bell curve for muscle strength, at mid range you're the strongest, and at end range you're the weakest. So uh, if you were to stand there, any any pitcher on earth, anybody that throws, and you were to externally rotate your arm, nobody's able to go all the way back where their forearm is almost parallel to the ground. So you'll see that uh, the ball on the way to the arm will go there passively. So if we're passively going there, it's kind of crazy to think that our muscular system could actively pull us out of that. So what happens is as your trunk starts to rotate and your arm starts to accelerate forward, we're offloading the stress that goes to the passive connective tissue, which we're pretty much targeting the ulnar collateral ligament, the medial elbow. So when you go back, it'll help with acceleration and it'll also help with deceleration. So it's kind of like having an external rotator cuff. Um, it's also going to stabilize the glenohumeral joint like a rotator cuff, and it also helps reinforce uh, the labrum. <clears throat> so we even have hitters that wear it on their lead arm if they have labrum issues. Uh, so with the elbow, the kind of anchor point for the end of the sleeve, and I call it a, a multi-joint dynamic stabilizer, and it's the first of its kind in any sport, especially to where we can show objective data. Uh, when you put it on, you can feel how it works. But we're essentially cutting that lever of the forearm in half. Um, so we think about mechanical engineering terms. Uh, so we have kind of musculoskeletal uh, engineering, uh, you know, structural engineering. But with the mechanical engineering, we're essentially cutting that lever in half. So we're getting a drastic stress reduction. So we've been able to show up to 30% stress reduction at the elbow consistently. And that's not counting what the sleeve itself is taking on and absorbing. Um, you know, externally, but the great thing about that is all this stress is absorbed by the sleeve, and then uh, you don't have to sustain all that stress internally because, as we know, you only get one shoulder and one elbow, um, and Tommy John's definitely not a good solution. I've had plenty of athletes that I've, I've had in here that have had to rehab that I've had 
not only one but two Tommy John surgeries. So uh, it's a small investment to keep you, you know, healthy and performing and playing the game that you love. It's pretty amazing the videos that I've seen, and you can look, you can go and learn more about the kinetic arm at thekineticarm.com. Uh, you can also look on YouTube, and you'll find videos of Jason explaining what it does. And if you if you have never heard of the kinetic arm and you're interested, I certainly would suggest that you check it out. But this is something that Jason, as you and I have talked, I I feel like every pitching coach in the country needs to hear the things that you have to say in addition to just kind of seeing the arm because, uh, and we'll get into this stuff later in the podcast, but you have ideas that are very contrary to, um, to a lot of the teaching that's out there right now with pitchers, but let's stick with the kinetic arm for a while and, and talk about this. What happens when, so guys put the sleeve on, they throw with the sleeve, they, they see this tremendous reduction in stress on the shoulder and the elbow. Um, what are, what are then the results that you've seen based on, you know, the data you've collected so far, what are the results when you take it, when they take the sleeve off and, and throw without the sleeve in a game? Uh, so we'll see, typically we'll see a carryover effect. So the guys that like using the sleeve to warm up, you know, before the uh, before the game, before pitching or playing the field, sometimes we'll see an increase in velocity a couple miles per hour. So it's there's a term called post-activation potentiation, which basically means if we can reintroduce the muscles um, that are kind of shut down and we have a compensation pattern, which is going to lead to more breakdown. Um, if we can put a little bit of stress on those and kind of ramp that up, uh, the brain is going to let them participate again. So that's why corrective exercise is kind of a myth. I know this because I had my pec ripped off for two years, had it put back on. Then we did some muscle testing after all my therapy and I still couldn't hold a position. So neurologically that was shut down because, you know, my brain knew that it wasn't fit to participate you know, back in those motions yet. So if we can re reintegrate those muscles that weren't working and then kind of uh, get that neurological adaptation where your brain and body get used to that limb moving faster through space, it's very similar to the overspeed training concept where um, if I've got an athlete and I want them to get faster off the line for a 40, 60 um, or a broader vert jump and you have a bungee pulling them, uh, you know, offloading them a little bit, then they're going to be able to accelerate and explode faster because they just adapt to that offloading. Um, so we'll see, you know, similar to that offloading, onloading, it's excellent to where when you're throwing the plow balls or doing the weighted balls uh, with weighted balls, yeah, there are benefits, um, but the risk is kind of, to me, not worth the reward. And I've rehabbed a lot of guys here from, you know, popular weighted ball training places that blew their elbow out a week or two after leaving there. But you know, wearing the sleeve, that's the only way that you can offload stress and, and throw these weighted balls so you can kind of get the benefit without getting the, uh, you know, the harmful effects of, I mean, a five ounce can wreck your, a five ounce ball can wreck your arm. So, you know, a eight, 10, 12, 16 ounce ball can certainly wreck your arm a lot faster. And we might just have gone down a rabbit hole there where we're going to stay for a while with the weighted balls. <laughs> Um, and I, I absolutely want to talk about that for a minute, but I, I just, just, I want to address something that you just kind of mentioned. So you are, you'll have guys that will throw with you or on their own that will throw weighted balls, plyo balls using your sleeve. So they get the benefits of it without the stress. Is that something that, that you do? Or is that something that you just, you know, your that other guys have done with the sleeve, not necessarily with, uh, with, with sort of your blessing for that. Um, I'm just not a, not a weighted ball guy. Um, but it's, it's trendy. It's probably not going to go away. I, so in my kind of muscle lab, um, and I consult for orthos, chiros, PT. So I'll get sent the guys that are injured from these popular programs. So you guys might see, uh, these great stories about, you know, how one of these online programs took an athlete from 78 miles per hour to 95 miles per hour. What they're not going to tell you is how many guys got injured from their program. So they have this, you know, rapid increase in workload but it's not sustainable. So they want to post about the results, but I'm kind of, you know, the mechanic in the garage fixing all these train wrecks that, you know, these popular programs cause. So I see, you know, the, the bad side of it. So to me, um, you know, we can increase the velocity and sustain it a lot safer by using the sleeve instead of chucking these weighted balls. And there's pretty, um, pretty good research and, and some good stuff that uh, Mike Reinold put out about, you know how you can cause humeral torsion throwing weighted balls. You can desensitize the stretch receptors, damage the plasticity of the tissue. Um, there's a lot of damage that you can do with throwing these weighted balls 
Um, but there's zero controversy with, you know, the underloading or overspeed training. So the sleeve is definitely a safer alternative to using the weighted balls. That's why I don't see any reason to train with them. I mean, the elbow is a hinge joint. It does flexion and extension. So when you take your, your arm back and you've got the weight of the forearm and the weighted ball and it's going back and your humerus starts to internally rotate forward, the amount of stress at that elbow is pretty high. And it's you could kind of compare it to uh, placing a five-pound weight on your foot or dropping one, or even with a, a one-pound weight. If you drop that one-pound weight, forces mass times acceleration, that's a lot of force because that mass and the acceleration, that's what's going to you know give you that force. So you know, your arm cranking back and then trying to accelerate forward, there's there's really just no reason for it. We could be a lot smarter and a lot more precise with our force applications, but unfortunately, anybody with a social media account is an expert, and that's why we're seeing all these injuries. All right, so now I feel like we do need to go into this a little bit more. Um, <laughs> so, so you, I'm going to come at this, if I can, like like a guy who's on social media, baseball social media, which I am, and like someone who's seen what's out there and what people are promoting and, and who's kind of yelling the loudest, which is a term that I use a lot because I think that's a lot of what social media is. The person that yells the loudest a lot of times on social media is, is going to be declared the winner and the person who knows the most when we all, hopefully we all know that that's not always the case. So, so plyo balls and weighted balls, you're not a fan. Um, tell us, just let's just start with this. And, and you've already touched on it a little bit. Why why are you not a fan of plyo balls and weighted balls, and how did you get to not be a fan of this? Like, what what happened? What kind of data did you see? Research have you done? You know, your your professional opinion. You know, why did you get to a point where you're not a fan of this stuff? Um, anything that so I like to be as precise as possible. Um, you know, you see a lot of people talking about throwing weighted balls or a lot of lectures about, you know, the thoracic spine or the T spine will try to sound cool and fascia and things like that. Um, but people don't even understand how the body functions. I've had athletes come in, you know, they'll throw their, their plyo balls, their weighted balls. They've had lat tears. They've had shoulder and other upper extremity issues. And when I put them on the table, they have no ability to control or sustain a contraction with their foot or lower leg. So, what does it matter what you're throwing or how hard you're throwing if you can't even get that ground reaction force? So we're trying to apply force at the very end of that motion when they can't even produce force and get that ground reaction force or, or be stable with their rotation all the way down the chain. So if you think about it, these guys are basically standing in a sand pit or on ice and they can't use things in, in the bottom part you know, of their body. So the more you apply stress at the end of those segments, I mean, they're putting too much stress through the shoulder and elbow. There's ways you could be a lot smarter. And back to kind of whoever's the loudest on social media, the smartest people are not going to be on social media correcting all these people. Um, to me, it's kind of like kids on the playground at recess. Like, well, I heard this and my dad said that. And it's like everybody's just kind of making stuff up or regurgitating it because, you know, they got to sell their, their uh, kind of, I don't know, I guess they're just trying to make money. To me, there's no integrity in that. You know, if they have no education, I've even heard somebody say the way the body's been studied for 300 years is all wrong. Um, I wonder what he did for his 300th birthday party. Maybe he's a vampire. Um, just an incredibly unintelligent thing to say. But these people have big followings. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, if they have time to put out that much content, it means they're obviously not busy and don't have clients. Um, but there's a lot more precise ways that you can apply force and better ways that you can use elastomers and better force angles that you can use to not put that extra stress through the shoulder and the elbow, especially in an explosive motion. What are, what are some of the better ways to do that? And, and you're talking, you're talking better than weighted balls and plyo balls. Yeah. So if we're, if we're performing an explosive motion again, in a, and putting stress on the medial side of the elbow, um, we're already putting enough stress there throwing a five ounce ball. So to throw heavier balls, it just doesn't it doesn't make sense. I don't know if you've ever seen the sports science episode where they use a weighted bat and then they go back to the weight of a regular bat and their timing is off. So throwing a baseball, especially pitching, that's a skill. So all these things have to be in sync and timed properly. So when we throw that timing off, that's going to be more stress on certain areas. Um, there's also, a, I'll have to find the study, it was done with a, a Division One college. They were throwing... 
heavier shot puts the whole off season. And when they went back to the weight of the regular shot, put, they couldn't throw it as far. They can only throw it as far as the heavy shot put. So when you're changing your timing and things like that, and I don't like to use the word patterning, um, I guess we could say sequencing, although that's overdone too, but a pattern means it's the exact same every time. If you put an athlete on one of these motion capture things, which hopefully we get into the, the motion capture myth um, of just guessing what's going on in the body, because that's always fun to talk about. Um, but if you know, you have these things that you think are happening, but they don't understand, you know, what the mechanism of change might be or what the risk is on those tissues, you know, that are performing those motions to get that in, and range but essentially you're putting more load the furthest from the body but if you had that point of application of force closer to the body and let's say you take the elbow joint out of it or the shoulder joint out of it you can still do some great things to train hip shoulder separation or rotation without having to put all that stress through the elbow to me all these programs with you know chucking and slamming medicine balls a a three-year-old could come up with that there's zero science there's zero precision And it's kind of embarrassing seeing some of the things that are done. And if you look at it, they're not able to modify torque. They don't even know what force angle they're working with. Because if you drop that medicine ball, which way does it go? It goes straight down. So we have this thing called this thing called gravity that they must not be aware of. But if we're using a cable or an elastomer, you know exactly what your line of force is. And then you can use your straight and support to modify torque or, you know, pair up what's called a resistance profile, but um, you know, these people don't even understand that. They just want to chuck and slam things, especially using barbells for training. A barbell is an incredibly terrible tool. Um, you know, and people think, oh, it's the best way to build strength. If there's no pelvic shift, there's no rotation. I mean, you don't stand there in baseball in that position. And everybody wants to use the term stable. You know what the term stable means? Not moving. So they talk about stability. No, it should be about strength and motor control but everybody's just worried about what happens from point A to point B and just lighting up the radar gun. So, um, you know, that when there's, where there's no precision and not a lot of thought process and you're just uh, chucking and slamming things, then expect the injuries. And again, I, that's what I get in my office um, are the people that were injured from these other programs. And they come in here after spending, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. And then we take a look at their lower extremity and we see, you know, they don't have any internal or external rotation at that hip. But they just came from a college program that won the you know national championship. So why did that strength coach or athletic trainer not catch that? And then they were out across the country at this popular weighted ball place where they blew their arm out a week or two after that. So why were they not able to identify how much control he had at his hip and also one of his feet? He had no no uh, really no ability to sustain a contraction with his foot or lower leg. So that that could have been what contributed you know to blowing out his elbow. But if they don't have the basic skill set to look at the body objectively and see what's working and what's available that day. And I've seen some strength coaches post, oh, if your trainer doesn't have a workout ready when you get there, they're terrible. No, if you have a preset choreographed routine for that athlete when they get there, you're beyond terrible because that's why people get injured. I'm not sure what direction to go from there. <laughs> There's so much there. there I wrote down about. I've written down about we could we could be in a podcast for about twelve hours based on what I've written down so far, um, and I'm just trying to keep up with you here as much as I can. Uh, I, I actually I want to backtrack a bit and and just kind of ask about your background and your education if you don't if you can just kind of tell people, you know, just I, I guess I guess who you are and and why how you know what you know and, and kind of how you've gotten to this point and um, you mind just kind of go over, going over that stuff just. How do you know all this stuff and have, and have come to the point where you're, you're, you're frustrated with a lot of what is being seen and being, uh, people are seeing and, and what's being taught? Sure. So I, um, you know, after playing baseball almost 20 years, uh, from age, you know, 12 on, I had bad elbow pain and, um, you know, I was, I was a personal trainer at 17. So you think, you know what you're doing, right? And then, um, you know, I took some time off from baseball. I uh, started fighting in tournaments and competing in, you know, Muay Thai and submission grappling. Um, and I ripped my pec off the bone. And then I went back to play baseball. Pec still ripped off the bone. And um, I was sprinting, and I ripped my hamstring on the other side. And I thought, I've been running in a straight line for 20 years. Why did I just get injured doing this? So nobody stops to think, why did that just happen? And I go to the, you know, the physical therapy place. And they're addressing the hamstring, saying the hamstring was weak. 
that's an incredibly unintelligent thing to say that they were probably taught in school and they regurgitated. The reason that hamstring tore is because my left pec was detached, so I had an anterior tilt. So you have something called reciprocal motion, whereas when I'm pulling through with that right leg, my left shoulder goes back. So as you guys are listening to this, kind of go through that running motion, you'll see, oh, yeah, similar to when you're throwing, as you're pulling that left arm back, the right arm's coming through. So because I didn't have that reciprocal motion and that uh, scapular retraction on my left side, my right hamstring had to work a lot harder, and that's why it ripped, because the force demand was so high that it exceeded you know, the capacity of that muscle. Um, so that's kind of what led me into, you know, why does this happen? Why do these overuse injuries happen? Um, and I joke and say I've either rehabbed or, uh, had just about every injury you can think of by now. Um, then I went through the muscle activation techniques internship out in Denver and, uh, the first two weeks I'm sitting or the first two months, um, it was about 11 month class. I'm sitting there, I'm thinking I've been a trainer for 10 years, over 10 years. I don't even understand what they're talking about. So it was extremely humbling because I thought as an athlete, I know how things work. No, sports by definition should be anything not good for the body. We have an entire division of you know medicine called sports medicine because that's how common the injuries are, but nobody stops to think about it. And unfortunately, you know, sports is a shuffle. So when you get injured, there's 10 other guys that'll take your place. Um, so nobody really cares. Uh, they just want the guys that are, you know, the high performers so they can post more content. So after I learned everything I could about the musculoskeletal system, it was about 300 specific tests and treatments, and it was a lot of practical applications. It was a lot of hands-on. Um, after that, I took all their master's level classes to learn more about correlation, causation, um, and then with my own you know, athletic history and injury history, uh, I had a lot of aha moments that were really, really cool. Um, and that was when I had my pec surgery, you know, and then I was able to get out there and do some muscle testing for my shoulder and, and that area. Uh, but then I went through a program called resistance training specialist and all the, the master's level classes. And that was out in Oklahoma city. So that was learning about uh, kind of physics and resistance mechanics. So learning how to properly apply properly and appropriately apply uh, force to the body, whether it be, you know, an elastomer, a free weight, a cable, a machine. Um, so, after all that, I started teaching a class in my facility, and I've had a lot of physical therapists, uh, some that even have their master's or doctorate, and they didn't learn anything about resistance mechanics. And if they did, they don't know how to apply it. And I've had plenty of people come in and apply to work here that had a master's or a doctorate in you know, exercise physics or exercise science, and there were zero classes with practical application to get those degrees. So it sounds cool. On Twitter, it makes you look smart because you have some letters next to your name, but again, there were zero classes with that practical application. So what happens is they resort back to the things in their comfort zone that they did before they went and spent all that time and money. Uh, so they wrote a lot of great papers. Uh, they took a lot of great tests. But what did they really learn? They learned some big words. They come out. They try to sound smart. They spout off on Twitter. Uh, I call Twitter kind of like a litter box. Um, everybody just slinging some chat. And they really don't understand musculoskeletal mechanics or resistance mechanics. So that goes back to, you know, you have these people that are up on stage giving presentations about the thoracic spine. If you don't understand how the lumbar spine works, then the thoracic spine doesn't matter. And if you don't understand hip function, then none of that matters. And if you don't understand how foot function and the lower leg can directly affect the hip and everything up the chain, then learning about the thoracic spine doesn't mean anything. Um, because they don't understand how to identify and see what do these athletes have available and how can we prevent injury? Because if you stand with your feet perfectly flat, go ahead and press your medial arches down, rotate all the way to the right, but keep your medial arches down. Then if you let your right foot come up, you'll see you get about five or 10 degrees more motion. So right from that simple movement, you can see, wow, there's so much that influences movement up the chain. If I'm losing range from muscles shutting down and we'll say that, um, you know, muscle tightness is a protective mechanism. So you got to think when you wake up and, you know, or your hamstrings are tight, your hamstrings aren't playing a joke on you. Um, that muscle tension happens for a reason. So if you get cut, your blood coagulates and you form a scab. If you start to perspire, um, you sweat because your body wants to regulate that temperature. So it's all just basic homeostasis like we learned about in seventh grade science, but it's not cool or fun because we're not chucking and slamming stuff and, you know, making crazy videos. Um, 
but everybody needs to kind of back up and learn how the body actually functions. And then from there, we can start to make some progress. Um, you know, not only with learning foot function and how, how things work, but after the MATRTS teaching classes here, um, then before you know it, I'm getting patients sent to me from orthopedic surgeons that were with a lot of, you know, professional sports teams saying, Hey, this guy just had a, a bilateral knee replacement. We can't figure out what happened. Or, um, this patient, you know, had a failed, two failed cervical fusions. They had a shoulder replacement. We don't know why they're not recovering. Um, I've helped stroke victims get things moving that they haven't moved in 10 years. I've gotten people walking that were told they would never walk again from traumatic brain injuries. So to hear people argue about how to run, throw, and hit, it's it's not even entertaining anymore. It's just extremely embarrassing because those are really simple things to teach, but they don't even understand how to properly assess that athlete to see what's available that day. And then they don't know how to properly apply force and have strategic progressions that can help get that athlete to where maybe they can sustain all that stress of the weighted ball. Holy cow. I want to, want to ask you about something that I, I still think we need to talk more about weighted balls and plyo balls. You know what, before I ask my next question, I, I want to stick with, I just want to ask you this just as, as simply as I can. I'm a college baseball coach and I currently use weighted balls and plyo balls with my guys because my degree is not in kinesiology, but I've been told by all these people who seem super, super smart and they, they present at, um, you know, big events and, and they're very well thought of in our industry that that's what they're teaching. So I'm a, I'm a pitching coach at even a high school, I'm a high school pitching coach, you know, and, and I'm a, I'm a high school uh, I'm a I'm a math teacher, but I like I like baseball, and I've I've listened to these guys over and over again, and this is what I've what they're all doing. They're all doing weighted ball stuff. They're all doing plyo ball stuff. So that's what I do because that's what the the so called experts in our in this baseball industry are doing. What's a conversation that you would have with me, this this coach, high school coach, even a a college coach who's doing this kind of stuff? But again, this is I don't have a master's degree in this level, but I'm just I, I'm doing. I feel like I'm doing my due diligence by researching what people smarter than me are doing. And this is what they're doing. They're using weighted balls. They're using plyo balls. What's the conversation you would have with me, Jason, in just in, in plain terms as possible to try to talk me out of, of, of doing that? Um, so first, I'd say just because someone has an opinion on something doesn't mean they're qualified to do so. Um, and then, you know, just because someone – is up on stage speaking, it doesn't mean they're qualified, you know, to be up there. Um, again, someone might have a lot of letters behind their name, uh, or they might say they have a lot of experience, but as we were saying before this, you know, just cause you've been in kindergarten for 10 years, it doesn't make you a 10th grader. So I would ask them, what is the goal? And how did you ramp up to safely apply that force? The only thing I would do with a weighted ball that would not violate how your structure is and your structure dictates function i would put so if you stand up and you have your elbow on your rib so i'm right-handed so i've got my right elbow on my rib i'm going to take that weighted ball and i'm going to keep my elbow on my rib and i'm going to fire it down almost like a tricep extension and finish with my forearm with forearm flexion that's probably the only thing that i would do with it because again the elbow does flexion and extension so if you lift your forearm up like you're doing a bicep curl and then you extend it you know, like you're doing a tricep extension or a cable push down. And then from there, you know, if you can kind of, I don't want to say isolate that joint because it's not possible, but try to keep that in place and then finish by really flicking down with your fingertips. Then you can put some good stress through your forearm flexors. When I say good stress, it's an appropriate amount because we're not overloading anything. So then we can get that adaptation. So that's what we always have to think about is, what is the stimulus and what is the adaptation or the desired adaptation? So that's one thing that I would do with a weighted ball is kind of fire it down, you know, into the ground. So when I have baseball guys come in, I'll have them do that with a regular baseball just to get a really good feeling of the seams and kind of finishing with that extension. And then they can kind of, uh, it's almost like they're better able to feel kind of how the release point is going to be or what the desired result is for their pitchers. But as far as, um, you know, coaches just going to a weighted ball program. Um, we've got to think about, you know, that's 
the ball is mass. It's the exact same thing as a dumbbell or a kettlebell or you know a tire, whatever it may be. So we've got, you know, basically if you drop it, it goes straight down. So you can create that force angle of throwing. So remember, inertia is an object's resistance to change. Um, and this goes back to uh, kind of if you, you know, place a two-pound weight on your foot or drop one from your shoulder, that's a good example of, again, forces mass times acceleration or inertia. Um, so if you've got that ball cranking back and then you're trying to throw it forward, yes, you will get more external rotation, but you've got to think, what are you doing to the structure of the shoulder? And before you even go there, why are you stretching that shoulder? Because stretching, there's plenty of studies, and I've got several here that I can send over to you if you want to post them. Um, stretching shuts muscles down. Not only that, but with the shoulder, you can cause impingement. So you're stretching into all these ranges, and you're shutting muscles down, and you're causing impingement. So you're decreasing their force output, making the shoulder less stable. And then you're going to chuck this weighted ball, which, again, a five-ounce ball can wreck your arm. So what do you think a heavier ball can do? It can wreck it a lot faster. So I would stop and think, you know, what is the, the goal or the desired adaptation, and how can we have strategic progressions up to that desired adaptation? Which for them, it could be an increase in workload. Um, typically, they just want a fast increase in velocity. That's why we see the uptick in all these training programs, you know, with weighted balls. But if you were to give them, let's say you're on, uh, you're standing up, you've got an angle coming down towards you from behind you, and you've got a band in your first two fingers. I don't like it wrapped around the wrist like these uh, the J bands because when you don't have the tension of the forearm flexors, you're not able to protect the ligaments inside the medial elbow. So that's your first line of defense is the muscles there. So the, the fact that none of these or most of these things are attached to a ball or something that goes to your fingers, so you have tension to protect your medial elbow, um, just kind of reinforces the fact that you know people putting these products out don't understand basic anatomical function. But why wouldn't you have your athlete reach back, go into that, I guess, call it hip-shoulder separation, and then from there slowly go through the motion, pushing all the way out to extension. Um, and again, forces mass times acceleration. So, um, you know, if you're doing that fast, the cool thing about using a last immersion bands, there's no inertia involved. But if you do it with a ball, then you have inertia involved. And I know that's kind of a lot to a lot to take in, but, um, yeah, I would, I would really think about, you know, what angles they're trying to apply more load or more force with those weighted balls. And then if you think about it, you know, if you were under anesthesia, you know, on a, a hospital bed, you know, getting wheeled around and your arm fell off, it would rip right out of the socket because the weight of the arm is enough to pull that out of the socket when there's no muscle tension. So you already have a shoulder that's probably tired, especially if you have kind of a dropped or depressed or anterior tilt scapula. Um, so now you're going to end range where your muscles have the least amount of control and you're applying more force than you typically would, then, uh, yeah, you're going to overstress those things. And then there's also some good research that uh, Modus put out is Brittany Dowling and Ben Hansen, they call it fatigue unit models. And I know Driveline bought the Modus sensor. It's called uh, Driveline Pulse. But if you look on their website, you'll see where they have the study posted with the fatigue unit models. And it's showing that as you fatigue those forearm flexors by throwing faster, we could also think about applying more load, which you go heavier, they're going to get tired. And then you go to throw the baseball, elbow stress goes up instantly. So those are, I would highly recommend going and looking at that and thinking about, okay, if you throw a baseball fast, there's not much time in between your reps. If that is enough with a five-ounce ball to drive up that elbow stress, then when you're throwing a heavy ball and fatiguing those forearm flexors that are protecting the medial elbow, and then go to throwing a, a regular ball, they're already fatigued, so you're going to have more elbow stress. And that's probably a big reason why I've seen a lot of guys come in that have blown their elbow out after, you know, doing these trendy programs. All right. Me being the high school coach that I'm being right now who who is just hearing all these things for the first time and, and starting to really scratch my head, man, there's a lot of people – on social media who sort of mock throwing a heavier ball and how much stress that's going to put on your elbow. Uh, people that, that flat out say if the arm can handle a five ounce ball, you're telling me it can't handle a six or seven ounce ball, not in these exact words, but, but basically similar things to this and almost making you feel 
stupid to question whether or not you should have concern with throwing a heavier ball. Um, and, and talking about like a, like guys throwing a football, which I don't know how much a football weighs, but I'm sure it's more than a baseball weighs. Um, but, but basically Jason, it's, it's mocked and I'm sure you've seen this. It's mocked on social media that you would even be concerned with the fact that you're increasing the weight of a ball. Like, like the, one of the things that I've, I've read is like, what you, do you think your arm was built to throw exactly a five ounce object like what's the difference between throwing a five ounce object and again a seven or eight ounce or ten ounce object like your arm wasn't built to throw this one weight it's not it's not you're not it's you know you're you're an idiot basically if you think that you're going to get hurt by throwing something heavier when you could throw a five ounce ball and be totally fine uh help me to understand exactly just trying to make sense of all this in my mind. And I'm, and I'm sorry that I'm not doing a better job of facilitating this, but I'm, I'm really just trying to, I know you've, we, you and I have talked before, but I'm trying to just keep up with you and ask questions. That I think people that listen to this might have, um, help, help me to have, have the proper amount of concern with the amount of weight when, it, when again, these social media, uh, guys that know a lot more than me and guys that have done a lot more studies and tests than me and, and have those letters behind their name are telling me that there's, there's really no difference. Um, and I shouldn't be concerned with throwing something heavier than a, than a five ounce ball. Yeah. So, um, so, uh, throwing a football, the mechanics are going to be different. So the object is not as far from the body. So the further the line of force is from the axis, that's what's called the moment arm. And the guys that are talking about that probably won't even know what that is because they never actually learned about resistance mechanics. But the further that line of force is from the axis, the more, torque you have to produce so um and i'm not damning weighted balls completely there there potentially are safe applications um but it's kind of the dosage determines the poison and it's also like is a, a screwdriver a good tool yeah it is you know you can do some cool stuff but you can also wreck stuff you know if it's not used properly or a hammer so the people that don't think that a, a 10 or 12 ounce ball is more stress I would encourage them to take, go, you know, stand up, take their socks off, and then drop both of them on their toes and tell me which one hurts more. Um, or hold a little luggage scale. You can get a $7 luggage scale, tie it to something, so it's it's got a nylon strap that doesn't move. Drop the baseball from your shoulder height and see what the reading is on there. And I do all this testing with a digital dynamometer in my office, so we get extremely accurate readings on uh, force or stress. And then do the exact same thing with the weighted ball. And 100% of the time, the object with more mass is going to have a higher force output. So if it's measured in minus foot pounds, you'll see it's going to be more foot pounds of force. So that eliminates any discussion. It's not even a discussion. It's not even a conversation of, is it more stress? 100%, it weighs more. So you could look at, uh, you could make the argument if you're throwing a five ounce ball harder than that weighted ball, then it would be more stress. Yeah. But if you've for all your life been throwing this five ounce ball, that's pretty much what your body's adapted to. Um, and then if they think that the stress isn't harmful, uh, there's plenty of research showing it can cause humoral torsion on younger kids. So if your bones haven't formed yet, it'll actually twist your humerus. And this is nothing new. So for the people that argue throwing a weighted ball isn't dangerous, it's enough force to actually change the structure of your bone. So if it's enough weight to change the structure of your bone, I'd say that's a significant amount more force. There's research out there that shows that? Absolutely. Mike Reinald did some great research showing, um, you know, things like that, uh, damaging, you know, the plasticity of the connective tissue. Um, And for the people that say, like, um, you know, your muscles are, you know, have elasticity or fascia, we can touch on that, too. That's always a fun one. but yeah, there's research showing it actually causes humoral torsion. So if it's enough force to where it's changing the structure of the bone, unlike a regular ball, that should be a little bit concerning. Now, we do have people that, uh, you know, they have their biases. But again, if when we're talking about stretching, fascia, weighted balls, or anything like that, if they get so bent out of shape about it, they should probably take a step back and realize, wow, I have a heavy bias, and I probably should ask more questions. Because, you know, the people that, um, you know, they 
their weighted ball people or their kettle, their kettlebell people, um, you know, those are all tools and a weighted ball is a tool. So if that's something they kind of, you know, live and die on the sword by, then that's a problem and they, they shouldn't be training or coaching anybody. They should understand that that's a tool. There's different ways to apply force. And, you know, again, there could be some applications for it. Um, but the way I see them used and the way I see them, you know, on social media, they're pretty poor applications. And for them to say they have any data showing otherwise, um, I'd love to see that. I'd love to see the study because there's going to be a lot of variables that they don't even know to take into account. And before, again, we even get to throwing that heavier object, do they even understand what's available that day on the athlete? Because I've had some athletes come in with some programs they paid thousands of dollars for. And um, then I get these athletes on the table and they're functioning extremely poorly. So why did they just invest thousands of dollars for a weighted ball program or a strength training program when these people haven't even seen them in person, they haven't performed an accurate assessment and they don't even know what's going on. So before they should start to apply any force or load, they need to know what's going on with these athletes, especially before they take the money. Cause that's flat out fraud and they're ripping people off. This episode of figured out baseball's podcast is brought to you by diamond kinetics no matter what season you're in, our friends at Diamond Kinetics are here to help you train smarter, get better, and so you can dominate on the field this season. Diamond Kinetics line of mobile-based motion technology products give players and coaches the ability to practice smarter, practice more effectively, and have more confidence in the batter's box and on the mound. On the hitting side, DK's Swing Tracker Bat Sensor provides in-depth, comprehensive swing analysis for the data-driven baseball player and coach. Attach the sensor to any bat, swing, and immediately you see the barrel speed, bat acceleration, and 3D swing plane to enhance player's development. DK's revolutionary Swing Fingerprint identifies your hitting hot zones and helps you improve your approach at the plate. With Diamond Kinetics, you will train smarter and get better and have more confidence on the field this spring. Jason, if, if I can't build arm strength as a coach using weighted balls and plyo balls, like that's my tool, man. That, that's my tool in my toolbox. And I'm and I'm hearing this for the first time and, and almost like a little bit of, of a of a panic button going off. Like what am I gonna what am I supposed to do here? Like how you know as a as a if you're in the development side of things on the high school side from on the pitching side, like nothing is more important than gaining velo. And when I say nothing's more important, I mean, as far as you, what your clients expect from you, what, when, when like a 15, 16, 17 year old is going to a pitching guy in the, the world that we live in now, nothing is more important than the ability to help guys gain velocity. And whether it's right or wrong, velocity gets you noticed, velocity gets you recruited whether that's even if that's your only tool or if you have other tools to go with it, like your velocity, that tool needs to be there or people are going to walk right past you and go to the next pitcher, uh, whether you're talking about recruiting for a college program or, or, a, or a pro team. So if I'm this coach who's relying on weighted balls and plyo balls at this point for arm health and for building velocity, you know, your, your sleeve is obviously something they should look into. But besides that, like what, what the heck out, what is there? out there what should i be doing to help guys throw the ball harder which is really essential to them um getting recruited which is really in the recruiting part is really essential to guys keeping their jobs i would say and keeping clients um is that too am i am i simplifying that question too much or is that a fair question to ask yeah it's a fair question so the the sleeve is definitely the only thing you can wear that will offload stress while you're training with them so back to like the using that as a tool to increase velocity. Unfortunately, baseball has turned into, you know, velocity at all costs. Um, and, you know, they might get that velocity. It's, it's all about managing expectations. And that's the tough thing is because if you have a business and your customers, they have the expectation of increasing velocity. Let's say they come into my gym. Um, you know, it's going to be different, but they'll say, I want to lose 50 pounds in a month. I'll tell them, go jog around 285 that's the highway here that's a circle around atlanta go around jog around 285 till it dead ends you're going to lose 50 pounds you know really fast obviously it's not sustainable or you know starve yourself that's a great way to get there but there's a lot of ways you can get a, a big jump or increase in velocity but um yeah so it's it's managing expectations will you get them that yes are they going to be more likely if they have an increase in velocity 
can their body sustain that increase in velocity and are we exceeding their stress threshold at any area of the body because if we are then there's going to be an injury so that's the tough thing is yeah as a as a coach or a trainer these guys they're they're just concerned with an increase in velocity and um that's a big another big problem well social media itself is a problem but big problem is guys want to post their results um but they don't tell you about all the guys that got injured there's a a popular uh a popular tech guy for baseball and a friend was helping me out with the sleeve and he had a conversation with this popular tech guy who's an analyst on tv and i've seen him talk at conferences and uh he said well now you can just have tommy john be back in six months my friend said well which six months of the season do you want to give up when they're trying to recruit you when you just signed and now you got dropped or and by the way um i met with that guy showed him the sleeve the data in the next two years, his arm, his son uh, blew his arm out. Two years in a row. Big on weighted balls, big on tech. So it's just, you know, again, um, everybody wants velocity at all costs. But what, what is any, what are the precautions they're taking? How are they monitoring the workload? That's a big question is, you know, if, if you want to use the weighted balls, again, they're a tool. Yeah, you can get that desired result. Um, but is it sustainable? And how are you tracking it? So for the coaches that, you know, love the idea of having the weighted ball because we get an increase in velocity, um, I would really sit back and think, how are we managing the workload and how are we safely progressing? Because when you blow that kid's arm out, um, not only did you not get him up to, you know, the 90s, the parents are probably going to be pretty pissed off that their son blew their arm out. I've also heard, you know, a popular weighted ball guy probably the most popular way to ball guy get up on stage at a conference and say, don't be afraid to be wrong. Now to put it nicely, that's an incredibly stupid and dangerous thing to say to a room full of a couple hundred high school, college, professional, recreational coaches, strength coaches. Don't be afraid to be wrong. You better be damn scared to be wrong because if you injure that athlete, that's on you. So the whole mindset of don't be afraid to be wrong paired with throwing weighted baseballs, it's really disappointing. But unfortunately, that's what baseball's turned into. Um, and I've had plenty of athletes here that have blown their elbow out, you know, after that program. So it just goes to show, okay, it's great. You get that, uh, that uptick in velocity, but are you going to be able to keep playing? Yeah, everybody thinks that Tommy John now is something that's – it's just, it's no big deal. You're going to come back and, and probably going to throw even harder than you did before. And, and, and those, um, you know, those statistics just don't all add up, but I don't know that we have time to get into to that, but you know, there are several other things that we've touched on that I think we need to go back and can kind of expand on. Um, and I want to talk about one thing that you mentioned early on, Jason, the motion capture myth. What, what is that? So the motion capture myth, we've got, so have you ever seen a mechanic watch a car drive down the street and tell you what's wrong inside the engine? While they're driving? No, they're just standing there watching the car drive down the street. Can they yeah. tell you? No, it's not possible. <laughs> so it's a superficial assumption of gross motor function, which basically means we've got all this stuff flying through space. And what we're seeing is probably the best solution that the brain could orchestrate at that time because it knows what's available and what's not. So that might be the most uh, efficient way they can function to throw that baseball. Now, with the motion capture, they're going to say, your arm slot drop, get it up. Now, is that at the glenohumeral joint? Is that scapular elevation? Is it lateral flexion on the other side? Um, because if we change that, we might be causing impingement. So to think that by looking at the body, um, you know, I've seen that on, uh, on Twitter, too. Um, I don't remember what he calls himself, but... Uh, doesn't doesn't have too many friends on there, but you know he says he can look at you and tell you based on how other athletes function how you should function, which again is an incredibly beyond ignorant thing to say because you don't know someone's injury history, the structure of their joints. And I can send you pictures of differently shaped hip sockets, femurs, um, but if you don't have the skill set to put someone on a table or really I guess isolate certain parts to see you know if they even have the neurological integrity to contract on demand and perform that motion in those positions, you're just guessing. So I don't know if, if they were, you know, part of the X-Men and they got away, but they got some crazy cool skill where they can just look at somebody and tell you what's working or not working, but it's a total load of crap. 
not to say there aren't some cool things you can do with motion capture, 100%, but to watch somebody throw and think that based on what you see externally, you know what's going on internally is just beyond ridiculous. Okay, so I'm a pitching... Had, Go ahead, I'm sorry. I was going to say I've had a professional track runner on my table, you know, incredible athlete, very fast, and he was he was an absolute nightmare when we assessed, you know, active and passive range of motion. Um, and he wasn't able to hold most of the positional muscle tests. So, you know, he was a great athlete, and, uh, you know, a lot of the athletes... It's not, uh, you know, there were a lot of others just like him, but they kind of just lasted the longest. So, um, you know, the guys we see on TV are the guys that are doing, you know, really well. You know, they're able to sustain that extra stress, and maybe that's how they've adapted to functioning. So changing that based on what you see, you know, externally and not knowing what's going on internally. And, again, it's not a skill set that uh, the majority of people have, but for them to make those assumptions and tell you what you need to change or act like they know what they see is, is pretty ridiculous. So if I'm a pitching coach – and I have video from a pitcher in in the past a year or two ago, and he was really dominant with this particular a certain pitch, and uh, and now he's not been as dominant with that pitch. That pitch is now getting hit around, and I go back and I compare video from now to video from two years ago, and his arm slot has dropped, and I'm sitting there saying, well, that's why that's why he's not as effective with this pitch because his arm slot has dropped. So I'm going to go back to this pitcher and, and just. Tell him, hey man, you, you probably did it without really thinking about it. Your arm slot dropped. That's why you're not getting the same, the, the same effect and the same results with this pitch. Just get your arm back to where it was, the same arm slot it was in, and you'll probably have similar results. Um, are, are, have I skipped some steps there just by, by doing that? Because I think that's what a lot of guys are doing now, and I think it's again, it's kind of what you're, what you're being taught to do within this profession is use the motion camera to pick up, pick up stuff like that. And on the surface, that makes complete sense. I was having a lot of success when I looked like this. Now I look different. If I go back to what I was doing, I'll probably have the same amount of success. But you, you think that there are some steps that I'm missing there. The, missing the very first step is sitting there and thinking, why did that arm slot change? What, what changed in their anatomical function or neurologically to make that arm slot change? It could have been something was... Uh, shut down from stress trauma or overuse, and that's now the compensation pattern that they developed. But coaches really fail to sit back and think, why did that change happen in the motion? They think, oh, just move this or just do that or lift your arm up a little bit. No, you have to sit back and think, why did that happen? And that's where baseball as a whole is really lacking. And I've had uh, professional scouts in here. I've had um, really high-level guys some that have had Tommy John not once but twice. So just to show you why that's not, you know, um, well, that's not a good fix. But, yeah, it's it's really blowing past the first step, sitting back thinking, why did that arm slot drop? Instead of saying, oh, here's the problem. That's great. You've identified the problem. But what is the solution? So motion capture does a great job of showing you what the problem is. So how are you going to fix it? I had a company come in. It's called Dorsa V. They have these sensors that measure ground reaction force. So he came in and showed me. I said, I want you to come back with an athlete. He came back with a hockey player. His ground reaction force was 90-some percent on the right leg, 70-some percent on the left leg. I put him on the table. I saw he had a, an active or a, uh, limitation and active internal rotation on that left side. And then I could twist passively so we know that it's not a structural issue, right? So we do some positional tests, have him go back out, see what the sensors read. I got him to within 1% of symmetry as far as ground reaction force rather than saying we've identified the problem you need to work your left leg more no there were some things that were shut down and not working so that's the compensation pattern that he developed which caused him to function that way so for coaches to just compare what they see on a screen and again that's external performance but the problem is they don't understand internal performance I had Shane Green from Braves coming years ago when he had elbow pain we found that it was coming from his front hip. He had no internal or external at the front hip. He couldn't control the deceleration of the pelvis over his femur. We turn everything back on, test, stress, test, retest, and then all of a sudden the elbow pain's gone. I have athletes that come in with chronic hamstring issues. 9.5 times out of 10, it's that reciprocal motion from the opposite scapula that's not retracting or limiting trunk rotation. I've had dozens and dozens of kids come in with little league elbow or little league shoulder, and because they had growing pains or Seaver's disease or Oshkosh slaughters, 
they're not getting that ground reaction force or they don't have trunk rotation to the throwing side, that's why the arm is overstressed and they're getting breakdown at the shoulder and the elbow. Now, if you look at them on motion capture, you're going to say, oh, well, you're not, you're not rotating your body. That's a, yeah, thank you, Captain Obvious. We know he's not rotating his body. Let me tell you why and let me show you how we can fix that. So it's not a skill set that everybody has, but everybody wants to make the assumption. And, you know, they say, you assume you make an ass out of you and me. I say, no, it's just you. Because if you don't have the skill set to fix what you see, why are you even identifying it in the first place? So you're comparing motion capture. Okay, we saw this change. Great. Why did it change? Do you have the skill set to assess that? No. I see posts that some of these, uh, you know, motion capture guys make. They're like, oh, he... We did this exercise and it activated this. No, it didn't. That's a really stupid assumption to make. Unless you have the skill set to do a positional test and see if it can now sustain a contraction, whereas before it couldn't, you're just guessing. They're just guessing at what they see externally, and they have no idea neurologically what's going on inside, what's available not only that day but at that time. And that goes back to strength coaches saying you should have the workout planned out. Absolutely terrible. I've had plenty of world champion fighters come in. And, you know, baseball players can apply too, but um, it applies to them. So before we even start training, I ask a minimum of five questions because I need to know what's available that day. I don't care what they look like on camera. I need to break it down and see why they're functioning the way they're functioning, and that should dictate the workout you do, the throwing program that you do, or the prehab program that you do. But to look at it on a screen and see it moving through space and think you know what the problem is is completely ridiculous. I am completely unqualified to be hosting this podcast. That's no. very apparent <laughs> at this point. Uh, so, Jason, what I mean, what do I do about this? I, I, you know, okay, I've got, I'm a dad. I've got a four, I got a four and a half year old son at home who, you know, Grandy's four and a half, but he loves baseball. We throw around the house. He wants to hit constantly. You know, he just he loves to pitch. He loves to throw a football around. Whatever. He gets older, wants to play. Like, what do I do? How do I find somebody who's qualified to do this stuff? Or heck, if I'm a if I'm a college coach right now, if I'm a if I'm a junior college head coach, and I think my pitching guy is pretty good, but I know he doesn't know all the stuff that you know. Like I, I don't even know where where do I begin? Whether it's like I'm trying to help my son, or you know I'm I'm running a college program, and I just I don't know if my trainers know what you know. I don't know if my my pitching coaches definitely don't know what you know because it sounds like not that many people do. Um, what do I do? How, how do you get how do you get answers to this kind of stuff? How do you find people that can help you? I would look for um, people that have been through some type of modality where they can do positional muscle testing. Now, some of it is is kind of far fetched in a rabbit hole. Um, there's uh, it's called muscle system specialist course. Uh, some MAT specialists are good, um, but something where you can break things down and identify and correct what's going on and, you know, not take a physical therapy approach where you go straight to kind of rehab. Because if you're trying to turn things on, that little band exercise that you're doing in the wrong position, because it's not specific to where you are when you're throwing, um, you know, we're assuming that that's going to turn things on. But like after I had my pack ripped off the bone for two years, I had it, you know, they drilled two holes through my humerus, pounded it back in with anchors. I went through all the physical therapy. So, again, I went through the whole rehab program and was exercising. And then when we go back and test everything, I couldn't produce any force in certain positions. So that's a big eye-opener for me and hopefully for the listeners that corrective exercise is kind of a myth. Now, I would, I would encourage everybody to look at positional isometrics because that's an incredible way to increase kind of the workload, the force output, and the capacity of your body to function better and more optimally before we start trying to you know chuck the weighted balls around so if you see when you're looking at motion capture um let's say the arm slot dropped okay if you have them stand there and look at them if that shoulder is kind of dropped down then go the opposite way with it and perform a positional isometric and there's dozens and dozens dozens of uh, studies showing how effective positional isometrics are and guess what it's not dynamic so we don't have to worry about inertia we don't have to worry about how much force we're applying and is it safe? Am I exceeding the threshold that that tissue has? But if you have a drop scapula, show them, okay, you can elevate it, do maybe five sets, five seconds, just a light amount of force, or then you can go into retraction. 
So trying to go away that the body looks limited, and of course you're going to be limited by your structure. That's what people also don't understand is that structure dictates function. So when you see these programs online um, or on social media that say you have to have this many degrees of internal rotation at the hip, these guys have masters and doctorates, and it, it blows my mind how elementary the concept of structure dictates function is because if your bones aren't formed that way and you can't get that range like the seated 90-90 hip stretch, I've seen plenty of torn labrums from it. And not to mention, when are you going to 90 degrees of hip internal rotation? That's a really stupid thing to do. You don't go into hip internal rotation anywhere close to 90 when you run, when you throw, when you hit. So why all of a sudden is this trendy and it's the latest and greatest? And then at one of these pitching conferences, the guy says, oh, if it's hard to get there, then hold a kettlebell so it'll gently force you into that position. Gently and force don't go in the same sentence when you're talking about your body. Again, incredibly unintelligent thing to say. I understand why he was very nervous to be up there because he's saying things that aren't true and they're physically harming people. So that's another thing I would you know, consider with athletes. How does this feel? Pain is an indicator that something is wrong. It's like a check engine light. You don't drive your car faster and think the check engine light's going to go off, right? But somehow we think that if we throw more, then it's just going to feel better. And then stretching too. People are, it's, it blows my mind that uh, there's an Einstein quote about it, but people never sit back and think that perhaps the mechanism responsible for that injury or that adaptation, which is negative, you know, they think that that doing that more is going to fix the problem. I mean, they stretch more than probably more than most sports. They definitely, you know, don't understretch. But if you're stretching a lot and then you get injured, then you think that more stretching is just going to fix it. Ah, uh, if I bang my head against the wall and it gives me a headache, should I keep banging my head against the wall? I'm going to go with probably not. But some people on social media would probably say bang your head against the harder wall because, I don't know, maybe they think it'll make your skull thicker and you'll be a better athlete. <laughs> so I've told you it was a long time ago. You may not remember. But I told you that I had hamstring issues um, from high school through college, and I, I was never really given what I believe was a, was a good path to fix those hamstring issues. And like you kind of said, you you feel like, well, I, I you know I hurt my hamstring, so I, I mustn't have stretched enough, or my or my flexibility isn't where it needs to be. I've got to get more flexible in my hamstrings. I'm too tight in my hamstrings, uh, so I keep having hamstring injuries. Um, and I know that from, from when I told you that in the past, you, you about lost it on the phone, just <laughs> to have that conversation <laughs> with me. So, um, let, can we, can we kind of, first of all, you have time to keep going here? Are we okay to keep going for a little bit? Yeah, I can nerd out for days. Okay. So stretching, um, range of motion, which is a big thing within, you know, arms and hips, especially increasing range of motion is something that um, that baseball coaches talk about it and feel like is is important. But but you've kind of given me your ideas on stretching, range of motion, muscle elasticity, which you've mentioned in this podcast. And you just talked about you know structure dictates function. Can can you kind of um, and, and maybe this I don't know how long this takes, but I you know don't hold back here. I, I want to explore this as much as we need to. What are your – give me general thoughts on just stretching to increase flexibility and range of motion to increase joint flexibility. I, I want your thoughts on that. Go ahead. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop myself right there. So the first question I always ask, athletes especially, is after all the years of stretching your hamstrings, why aren't they hanging down behind your knees? Well, the first reason is because muscles don't actually stretch. Um, and some people say they're elastic. So hold your arm out in front of you. I want you to drop a five pound weight in your hand and not let it move. Or I want you to jump, stick to landing and not bounce up and down. So did you hit your magic elasticity off button or did they just not, did you just not bounce and the ball didn't bounce because perhaps no, they're not elastic. So muscle stabilized joints. So back to seventh grade science, homeostasis, um, you know, your muscles tighten up for a reason. That's a protective mechanism. So, you know, obviously your hamstrings aren't hanging down behind your knees. So when I hear people say, oh, this this modality makes your muscles longer. 
well, that's pretty stupid because I don't see my muscles hanging down. And unless the attachment sites change or the bone or the lever gets longer, then how are they going to function optimally? I'd have a lot of slack, right? So you need that muscle tension. And a uh, good example, so I had a uh, ultra marathon runner come in. Her last run was 110 miles, multiple stress fractures. Um, I think she even had some torn ligaments. And she's complaining about her tight hamstrings. Do you know what the only muscle tests were that passed and she was able to sustain a contraction? Her hamstrings. Her hamstrings are pulling so tight because everything else is absolutely wrecked. And that's her brain and her body protecting it. Just basic homeostasis. So also with all the stretching that baseball players do with their arms, why don't they stay that stretched out? Because the brain knows what it's doing. It restricts you from going back into that range because it's a vulnerable position. Then you have something very basic that strength coaches don't even understand, but they should call the length tension relationship. And when I ripped my pec off the bone, it was a strength coach that had a CSCS, his USA weightlifting. And he didn't understand the basic common sense principle of if you don't, if you're not actively able to go back into that range, why would you apply force there and think that you can, uh, think that you can produce force to get out of it. And that's why in, uh, you know, CrossFit, maybe they'll try to sue me over this, but, um, you know, a couple of years ago in the CrossFit games, they had 50 something pec tears happen. Why? Because there's no common sense. Because if you're going down with the weight of your body into a dip and elongating that pec and thinking, again, the you know, forces mass times acceleration, so you've got the weight of your body going down into a range where you're anatomically the weakest. You have the least mechanical advantage to push back out of that position. And you're over, overloading that range, of course it's going to tear. It's just basic common sense, but they don't have that. And, now, you know, they say that's the sport of fitness, but, again, that's sports. With sports, there's not a lot of thought that goes into it. Um, so with the stretching, uh, you know, if, yeah, mobility is a big buzzword, um, you know, stretching and smashing things, I can show you with a digital dynamometer how that shuts your muscles down. But if I punch you in your shoulder, is that going to make you function better or worse? Probably not better, I'm going to say. So it's the same thing as using a massage ball or a, a lacrosse ball or a, a little Theragun jackhammer. So why is beating the crap out of your muscles good for you? We can say that about a foam roller as well. They say, oh, we're releasing the fascia. The collagen fibers that make up fascia have a 2,000-pound tensile strength. You're not changing a damn thing. No human on earth is capable of deforming that fascia. There's plenty of studies showing how strong it is. And when they say, your IT band is tight, no, it's not. It's not physically possible. It doesn't have contractile capabilities. So if it can't shorten, it can't lengthen. So what I see, anybody that comes in and, were told that you know their IT band was tight is they don't have internal rotation at the hip because the hip internal rotators aren't able to hold the tension they normally would so the external rotators tighten up and that's why you get that sensation there the external rotators at the hip compensating which put more tension there but no your IT band is not tight it's like when I would go to get a massage and they would beat the crap out of my upper trap and say oh you're your uh, upper traps are overdeveloped. No, that's a great scapular elevator. It's an upward rotator. Uh, don't touch it. You know, they, oh, it's it's very tense. Yeah, I carry stuff a lot. It should be. It's basic homeostasis. It's your body's adaptation to that stimulus. That's what happens. It's like when you do uh, strength training appropriately. Or, you know, think about um, with weighted balls. Think about a callus to a blister. Yeah, if you start, you know, chucking these heavier balls you're probably going to get a blister, you know, rip the skin off. So that's an example of you're not ready for that, or it's not a strategic uh, progression, you know, for that adaptation. It's going to take time to build up that workload so you can sustain that force, but the way it's being done is is causing injury. Or you think about uh, getting a suntan. You go outside, you know, do you go out there and go full throttle, just lay out there for an hour, slather up some oil? You're going to burn. So why wouldn't you go out there and do a little bit, maybe 10 minutes, you know, see what the result is. Then the next time, maybe do a little bit more. But all these programs, and like you were saying, we're trying to manage expectations to get velocity as fast as possible. Well, that's not sustainable, and that's why we're seeing all these injuries. But with the stretching, I think it's a way for, um, you know, strength coaches and people on social media, a big, a big thing is they have to put out content, right? So a lot of times they're posting things that just they're – I don't know what's a good word or a, a polite word for it, but it's crap. Um, and like you were saying, you know, whoever's the loudest on social media, 
uh, I see some of these experts and gurus. Uh, so first of all, question everything. Sit back and think, why do I need to stretch into this position? And then did you ever notice, or here's a good example. I want you, I want, well, I don't want people to do this, but I want someone to do it that just loves stretching. Stretch the life out of your shoulder. Go ahead and do what you're telling people to do. And then I want you to get on the mound and throw 100% max effort as hard as you can. And let's see, first of all, if you have any accuracy. Second of all, if you're going to tear anything. And do you know why you start out lightly throwing after you just stretch the life out of your shoulder? Because you're putting muscle tension back into your shoulder so you can ramp up and throw harder. So unknowingly, people are undoing what they just did with the stretching by starting out lightly throwing. You don't get done stretching and go throw just gas. You start out light, and you're putting muscle tension back into the system to stabilize that shoulder. Now, if people understood positional isometrics, we wouldn't be doing any of this stretching. We would do positional isometrics so you can have better motor control and a more stable joint, and then you can just jump right into throwing. But nobody wants to learn that because you'd have to spend time in a classroom or invest in yourself. So that's another big thing is, you know, we've got these weekend certifications and all of a sudden uh, people are experts and they've got, they got these letters behind their name and maybe some coach endorses them. But, um, you know, that's, again, why is the injury rate so high from – a sport where we're just throwing a ball. I I don't think we can get into this rabbit hole right now because I've got a couple other questions and, and I, I know we're probably pushing it for time as it is, but I have asked several people without a great answer why 30 years ago guys could throw 250 innings, come to spring training fat and out of shape, and, um, and, and be ready by the time the season started to throw 250 to 300 innings. And, and we don't have nearly the injury rates. And, and you don't need to answer this because I'm sure that we'll we'll be talking about it for an hour. But um, but I just I, I wonder about some of these things. And I ask these questions, and I feel stupid asking these questions because I just I feel like you know somebody's gonna think I'm an idiot for asking that. But I, I just I know that guys throw harder now, but I don't think that guys throw so much harder that the injury rate should be what it is. I follow baseball, major league baseball, enough to know. Uh, that that there are records being set basically every year with the amount of guys that are going on the injury list and and the number of guys that teams are having to use to get through a season and the number of you know major leaguers who are at, you know 25 years old and in the best shape of their life who can't throw more than 160 innings they're on an innings limit because they're going to get hurt if they throw more than that and it just doesn't make sense to me and I'm not I don't have any sort of degree that would allow me to have that opinion or, you know, I don't, I don't even coach anywhere currently, but I just can't, I can't help but wonder this over and over again. And maybe we have a second podcast to talk about that, but I do want to ask you a question about something that you just, you've mentioned about like stretching and range of motion. I have a couple more things to ask you along those lines before we turn from that. What about joint mobility? Um, you hear this with catchers and I think with pitchers as well, but like even with catchers talking about hip mobility and and that you can increase hip mobility. Um, True or false. I can increase my hip mobility if I work on my hip mobility. I mean, if that's the goal, I think the, what they don't realize is, um, you know, going to a yoga studio, you find guys that can twist themselves up into a pretzel. It doesn't mean they can throw 110 miles an hour or they're going to be a great catcher. So mobility without stability is vulnerability. So if you have these ranges, you can go into, but anatomically, your body's not built to control them or produce the amount of force it requires to explode out of that position and throw the ball down a second, you're going to have a disaster. So if just being flexible is your goal, um, and did you ever notice that the people that really like stretching are good at it? It's kind of a, a funny thing when you when you think about it. Um, Are they but, good at it because they do it a lot or good at it because that's how their body was just built that way? Yeah, they could have those uh, they could have those structural adaptations because they started doing it at a young age or they're just hypermobile. But again, just because you can go into a range doesn't mean you need to apply force there. Um, but backing up to what you're saying about guys, you know, back in the day, you may not have the, you know, the fancy degrees, but what you do have is you're smart enough to have the thought process of your own and ask that question. And a big reason for that is there's a lot, there was a lot less stress on the arms back then because stretching is stress. That's stress on the tissue. Weighted balls is stress, stress on the tissue. 
uh, chucking and slamming medicine balls. Again, why is the point of application of force out at the hand where we're putting more stress, a high volume of stress through the elbow and shoulder, and we're not giving it any rest? There's so many different ways that we could train, but you know, just like you're saying, it, it's crazy. But the more mobility programs, the more weighted ball programs that have been coming out, the more arm injuries we're having. It's not a coincidence. But everybody thinks that, you know, if they if they uh, regurgitate something, they sound smart. Um, you know, so it's I always say regurgitation blocks innovation. Um, I mean, for me, it was, oh, it was probably a six, seven year journey and probably almost $100,000 to learn everything. But it was putting the time in. And again, taking someone that was told they would never walk again and getting them to walk or a stroke victim that hasn't moved a limb in 10 years, getting that to move. That's what these trainers and coaches need to experience. And then they can truly learn about motor control instead of throwing around buzzwords and thinking that everybody you know, needs to stretch and smash. Uh, one junior college I played at, uh, he wanted us to be really flexible. I could lay my arm elbow out in front of me, externally rotate down to where it was flat on a table. So parallel to the ground, my velocity dropped, you know, down to low 80s. Uh, I wondered, you know, what's wrong with me? I'm, I'm very flexible. And then when I stopped and I went home in the summer and I started hitting the weights and I lost all that range of motion, I got back up to the mid-90s. So that just goes back to muscle stabilized joints and muscle tension is a good thing. I've got a skeleton in my office and I always ask people, why can't they stand up? Obviously, it's not alive, but there's no muscle tension. So if we're stretching and undoing that muscle tension, we're making the athlete less vulnerable. And again, mobility without stability is now vulnerability. So they can't produce as much force with some of the muscles they need, which is going to change their timing. And then if that, that uh, you know, the muscles, if that active, we'll call it an active tissue because it's generating force, if those get tired or shut down, then the stress goes to the passive connective tissue, which is going to be that ligament or the UCL. So, um, then we look at, you know, mobility with the hips. Um, I can send you the, the pictures of, you know, these hip sockets and how they're shaped differently. But again, you know, people are getting ripped off online with these programs saying you need to have this, this many degrees of motion. And I've even seen uh, one of these trendy programs that, um, you know, they're trying to show you how to assess uh, mobility and they don't even know what they're looking at. They don't know how to isolate certain ranges. They're kind of looking at, again, gross motor function, which means everything moving through space but they don't have the skill set to identify a specific axis or axis and see, you know, can they even sustain a contraction there? They just think more range of motion is good. And then another great question to ask coaches that love stretching. Have you ever seen a layback phase go all the way down to where their hand hits their butt or the back of their leg when they're throwing? No. So stop cranking that arm back in external rotation because when you, when you do a slow-mo and you can do it with the motion capture, you're going to see their arm isn't going any further back into layback than it than it used to. So it's completely ridiculous to think that, you know, the more you do that, um, you know, that it's, it's going to benefit you. And then with the seated 90-90, things like that, if you have more internal rotation at the hip um, or you look at a sprinter, let's take a sprinter, for example, you're going to see them when they're going fast, their brain orchestrating the most efficient solution for that movement, which means – they're functioning as best as they can with what's available. Now, if you go and stretch everything out, and let's say you get them more range, their legs are not going to come up behind their head or go up in front of their face because the muscular system can't efficiently control those ranges, so it's not going to let you go into those. Not only that, but we could look at uh, the levers and things flying through space and mechanical advantage, um, but to think that we need that extra range and we can actively control it, that's why people are getting injured. Do you think that people should not stretch? Should teams not stretch? I mean, why? Uh, this is again. Th these are things that I've just your a, a lot of your ideas and and your thought processes are so much different than everything that I heard. My whole playing career and and coaching career, and I wasn't the expert behind any of this stuff. Like you're listening to your coaches in high school, you're listening to your trainers in college. Uh, and your trainers, even as a college coach, should pe do baseball players not need to stretch at any point? I mean, or or is there is there is there some benefit in in moderation, or or does it need to be like a dynamic warm up instead of a, a stretch? 
um, you know, before and what about after, after working out, uh, it, is there ever a time where guys should be stretching? Yeah, great question. So it kind of goes back to the dosage determines the poison. If it's just a, a little light stretch, probably not going to cause many harm, but there's, again, there's plenty of great objective data showing that, you know, the more you stretch, the more it's going to decrease your force output and shut muscles down. Uh, Louisiana tech did a study with four different control groups. So they had three control groups that did some type of stretching, whether it was one side of the body or the other or both. And then the fourth control group didn't do any stretching. So when they timed these sprinters, the three control groups that did any type of stretching, their times went up, meaning that the athletes performed worse. It made them slower. So I would sit back and think, what is the goal? What is the desired adaptation? Usually it's a feel-good thing, but you know what also is? Picking a scab. It feels good to pick that scab. You think you should be doing it, but that's also one of your body's protective mechanisms. It's there for a reason. So if your body is restricting you from going into a range, there's a reason for that. So always think, you know, why am I stretching? And what is the proper dose of that? What is the amount? Because when you're taking a limb, especially the shoulder, and stretching it back behind you or up over your head and cranking it back, you're now causing impingement, smashing the rotator cuff, which is not a good thing. So it's just, uh, you know, the dose just determines the poison. But what athletes should be doing is some type of movement prep um, where it's a movement specific to what they're going to be doing. So a good warm-up for baseball, you know, you've got jog down, back pedal back, uh, got some crossovers for the arms and legs, side shuffle, high knees, butt kicks, you know, some walking lunges. So what we're doing then is we're putting tension into the muscular system. So it's essentially movement preparation. So we need to prepare the muscular system to perform and positional isometrics is a great way to do that. But stretching is not a good way to do that. If you want to stretch afterwards because you feel good, you know, that's probably fine. But again, the dosage determines the poison. Um, so you could definitely overstretch and cause some damage. Um, and then we can get into lactic acid. You know, coaches will say go run to get it out, but there's actually a research study done in 1936 uh, showing, you know, it was about lactate. So lactic acid actually metabolized in the body within 20 to 30 minutes. So the next day when the coach is saying, oh, go run or stretch and get that lactic acid out, man, that's gone. That's inflammation. And, again, that's your body's response to stress. So it's going to tighten up that range because you just overworked it and the brain knows you shouldn't go into that range and use it because you're going to get injured. I have been thinking for a long time that I want to get someone on the website, on the Figured Out Baseball website, that uh, does sports-specific yoga. Um, I never did yoga as a player. I do it now as a 36-year-old because... I don't do it all the time, but I do it sometimes because it makes my body feel better. You know, I sit at a desk all day. Uh, my hips hurt. I get some, like, tightness in my upper back and neck. And, and I try to, you know, I exercise pretty regularly. But, but like, I do yoga because it makes me feel a lot better. And I know that there are there's sports-specific stuff out there. I know I saw Marcus Stroman post yesterday on Twitter that yoga is one of the things that he does in addition to a bunch of other stuff. But, but you're kind of saying that, uh, based on what you're saying, I, I feel like maybe – that's something I should stay away from, from the website, but I, I wanted to put it on there because I think it could help programs out there, but it, it sounds like maybe you feel otherwise. Uh, I'm curious to know whether you think yoga is something that athletes should be doing. Uh, and then I've got a follow-up question when you answer that. Question. So it, it depends on the type of yoga. There's the yoga where people think they should be tied up into a pretzel and don't realize that they have these things called bones in the way that are restricting them from some, special position that they think they're going to win a medal or a championship at yoga. And then there's the kind that's great for athletes and restoring, um, you know, the, the mental aspect is good, but putting that muscle tension, you know, that tension back into your muscular system. So what you're talking about, I mean, we're actually talking about positional isometrics. So it's kind of like saying is strength training good. Yeah, it can be great, but the way it's done a lot of places, people are getting absolutely wrecked. And the damage might not show up now, but down the road, absolutely. Look at Ronnie Coleman. For anybody who doesn't know who Ronnie Coleman is, go Google Ronnie Coleman. He did a lot of strength training. The guy can barely walk now. He's had plenty of back surgeries. He's absolutely wrecked. And then you look at other people that do strength training, but yoga essentially is strength training. So is Pilates, um, 
you know, there's a lot of different ways you can apply force, but yoga is a good way for you to work on positional strength. So it's not even necessarily sports specific, but it is position specific. So yoga can be a great tool as long as it's done properly and we respect the structure of your joints. I've had a lot of guys um, get injured. You know, I've seen get injured from yoga that'll come in and they don't want to admit it, but if they're going into like a downward dog and they don't have that shoulder mobility, if they can't raise their arm up over their head, then it's kind of crazy to think that they should try to hold their a large percentage of their body weight up for an extended period of time while impinging their shoulder and forcing that position. So that's another one of those things, you know, pain, pain is an indicator that something's wrong and just know whether you can or can't go into that position and you shouldn't try to force it. Is it, am I actually solving any problems with me as a, again, as a 36 year old, I think this stuff applies. I'm not just asking this for my own personal health, but, um, you know, if I've, if I've got a lot because I'm at a desk, I don't know if it's because I'm at a desk or, or whatever, but I have, you know, if I have tension and, and some tightness, like in my back, my upper back and neck, and I do some yoga that's sort of stretching those areas and I feel really good afterward, is that something that is creating a long-term solution or is it just sort of putting a bandaid on something that I probably have other issues going on and, and these other issues that I'm not taking care of would be the solution to fixing this long-term. And of course you haven't, seen me or, or tested me but like generally speaking can you answer that question yeah so whether it's a, a short-term or long-term solution um if you're going back to that position that caused that problem then it'll never be a permanent solution so if you're so we think about it you have that tension because your body's trying to hold you stable in that position right that's why your hip flexors tighten up your back really kind of tight because that's what the demand is the positional demand for muscle tension there. So if you're, you know, releasing that muscle tension as far as getting rid of the symptom, then that's a good thing. And it'd be even better to follow up with uh, putting some force in your muscular system or some tightness in another area that's maybe on the other side of that axis. So if you were to stretch out like your hip flexors because they're tight, they're pulling your hips forward into an anterior pelvic tilt, or we could call it back extension, causing, uh, you know, discomfort in your lower back. Um, because of the compression, if you stretch out your hip flexors and then follow it up with putting tension into your hip extensors, so like glute max, glute med, some hamstrings, then that will help get rid of that symptom longer. But again, because you're going right back to that position, so when I have uh, people come in that you know have some kind of pain or discomfort, that's one of the questions I ask. What are some repetitive motions or positions you're in for an extended period of time? Because then we can find out you know why that's happening. So again, that goes back to the why. We've got to think, you know, why are these areas tightening up? Because they're in that short position for an extended period of time. So when your dog gets up from a nap and it stretches, it's just kind of restoring that length tension relationship because it realizes those muscles were shortened for a long period of time, just wants to get them back to, you know, kind of that regular length. Um, but as far as yoga for what you're talking about, yeah, that's a, that's a great way to not only relieve that symptom, but put some tension back into the muscular system and help balance it out. Because when we have those imbalances, especially with baseball, that's what leads to a compensation pattern, and that's why we have the blowout. Thank you for not just making that about my body getting old and, and bringing it back to athletes. Uh, <laughs> um, Jason, I, I I have enjoyed this very thoroughly, and I think that there are some areas that we probably didn't even touch on today, just some, some different areas altogether that we could get into in a different podcast. Maybe we can make that happen sometime um, but, but let me ask you before we wrap this up, is there one question that you, is, is there anything that you wish I asked during this podcast that I didn't ask something that you think is important to address? Maybe a thought you had at some point during the podcast or, or something else. Just, is there anything I, that I should have asked in this podcast that I did not ask? No, I think you asked some great questions. And, um, I think I always find a rabbit hole to go down and tie in anything that I've I think we, uh, you know, could have added to it just to make sure we, we don't miss it. Um, cause there's just so many, there's so many things that we could talk about because there's so many things that's wrong with the way athletes are training and the way people are training athletes. But, um, you know, as, as human beings, we want a simple fix and, you know, people will say, Oh, running's good for you, but Google the amount of running injuries there are per year. So it's, you know, unfortunately as a society, we want a quick fix. We want a magic pill. We want a special special weighted ball 
you know, that's going to get us up into the 90s fast. And, um, you know, people don't realize that you have to learn. You have to take a step back and learn as much as you can. But the whole, you know, somebody coming on stage and saying, don't be afraid to be wrong is, is the last way that things should be approached. So I think uh, the biggest takeaway from this for, for all the coaches or parents or athletes is, why am I doing this? And what is, what is the desired adaptation or result that I want to get from this? And then from there, they can better think, okay, is this the best way to get that result or is it sustainable? Because just like, you know, a callus to a blister, or, you know, getting sunburnt or a tan, um, we have to think about these strategic progressions up to what that desired goal is. So if we go out and start chucking a weighted ball and we don't have, you know, that stress threshold with our, our tissue, um, you know, active or passive, um, you know, we're going to have a blowout. So if we can ramp up that workload, um, but, you know, going back to the sleeve, that's why that's a great workload management tool. Um, just, yeah, I, I would always question, you know, question everything. Anytime you hear something or see a post, you know, question it. Because a lot of times they're just trying to vomit up some content to keep up with their followers. And then, you know, a lot of that they're putting into these programs and charging money for it. But, um, you know, I'm glad we touched on the motion capture part because, again, you know, seeing the way somebody functions externally doesn't mean you know what's going on internally. So there's, that's where I, it's kind of what I do for a living is bridge the gap between internal performance and external performance. But everyone's just concerned with, external performance and how hard you can throw and light up that radar gun or stretch from point A to point B or throw a lot of weight around. But, you know, those are the reasons and those are the causes of these overuse injuries and these surgeries. This has been really, really enlightening for me, and hopefully it has been for our listeners as well. This is Jason Collarin. Everyone, he's the owner of Elite Edge Fitness. Um, he's also the founder of the Kinetic Arm you can check that out at thekineticarm.com. It is truly magic when you go and watch what happens, and I, and I don't know that you can really understand it until or appreciate it until you just look at it for yourself uh, and just see what's happening, and, and hopefully some people out there will be willing to try it. But it's really I, – I, that's when I first uh, started talking with Jason. It was because I saw what was then called the perfect arm, now called the kinetic arm. I, I saw it online and, and like just thought I've got to connect with this guy and, and try to find some things out about this and see um, – if this is a product that I think figured out baseball subscribers need to be aware of it. And it certainly was. And, um, I've, I've really enjoyed getting to learn from you and feel a little bit smarter than I did at the beginning of the day, Jason. So thanks a lot, man, for your time. I certainly appreciate it. And I, again, if you haven't checked out Jason's videos on the website, I hope that you'll do so at figured out baseball.com. Uh, he's, he's got several videos out of, uh, at this point, nearly 900 videos that we have on the website that are completely free, covering every part of the game on the field, off the field, training, uh, the mental game, recruiting, and kind of everything else that you would need in the game. But, but Jason, I just want to thank you for your time and, and everything that you contributed today. This was one of the most educational podcasts that I've had uh, on this website, and I think a lot of people are going to benefit from it. So, so thank you so much for your time today. Oh, thanks so much for having me. And if you ever want to fired up again we can always uh break down anything and everything I, I love doing it love to help out so thanks for having me how can people get a hold of you jason last thing before we before i i, I stop recording here if people want to get a hold of you and just find out more about what we talked about today how can they do that i say the easiest way is probably through uh the kinetic arm website um all those emails go straight to me so especially the the customer questions um but i always check jason at the kinetic arm.com first um just to help we've got a lot of physical therapists using it in clinic and uh, doctors recommending it so i always want to make sure people are up to speed on uh, the training programs and um, i'll get a lot of great questions that don't even apply to the product um, but i'm just happy to help out and educate people so they can you know keep playing and stay pain free and function as best as possible